the dude, my man, Jeff Goodrich of his new book, Dude and Duder. Hmm. What's your favorite dad joke? What do you call a dog with no legs? What do you, what? It doesn't matter. He won't come anyway. My bad, Jeff. Uh, thanks. Uh, I could have laughed for a little bit longer. Uh, tell us a little bit about, just a, cue us up a little bit about your story here. Yeah, so my, like you said, I have a newly published book. And my book is essentially how my dog saved my life. And so that's why we started with a dog joke. Because the dog, his name is Duder. And I can tell a story how the name Dude came about. But it's essentially how my dog came into my life. And I went through a midlife transformation. And this is my lessons that I learned from Duder. And it's my story of transformation is, is my book. Yep. What's the story of Dude? So, okay. <laughs> In my book, we have uh, Duder is now six years old. And he's a Vishla, very, very active dog. And as I through the last few years, just watching and observing him, I was looking for lessons from him. Okay, Duder did this. What can I learn from it? And the, how Dude came about was in it, when this all started, Jay, I was in a really bad place. When I was 49 years old and hit 50, I was 75 pounds overweight. I was living what we call the standard American lifestyle, eating bad drinking my daily Dr. Pepper, watching TV on the couch every single night, absorbed in sports, absorbed in politics, all of it, right? And so I was in a bad place. My wife, who I've had, my wife, been, we've been married for a very long time, was actually considering divorcing me. She was putting some plans in place. I was not having a good relationship with my kids, not having a good relationship with life. Everything just was sucked right so we started i decide to bring this dog into my life we bring this new puppy in and we take him for a walk every day that's how it all started but one of the lessons we learned from him is when and anyone that owns a dog has seen this the first time a dog sees themselves in the mirror it's kind of a funny experience right so duder i was watching him he looks in the mirror and he's trying to sniff trying to smell i, I can't smell anything what's going on you know and it was kind of a weird thing. And the lesson I got from that is at that time, when I looked in the mirror, who did I see? Mm. And I was at a state, man, I call this my cringe factor. I'd look in the mirror and just cringe because I did not like who I saw. I had to truly change who I was. And so the same way that when Duder looked in the mirror, he didn't know who he was seeing. I was looking in the mirror and I did not like who I was seeing. Who do I want to see in that mirror? Who do I want to be? And so what I did in my head was create an alter ego. And his name is Dude. Hmm. So the idea is that Dude is the guy that has no regrets. Dude is the great dad. Dude is the great grandpa. The great husband. The guy that looks at life with optimism. Dude is the guy I wanted to be. So I had that's how Dude came about is when I looked in the mirror, I wanted to see Dude instead of the old me. So that's kind of the story of that. I love it. Um, <clears throat> these kind of transformations are, um, I mean, they take a long time. When did you, when did you realize that you had stopped faking the new identity and just become the dude? <laughs> that, well, you can answer that a couple of ways. One is, sure. the, you know, the old cliche, life is about the journey. Sure. So. Do I ever reach a point where I have become totally dude and the old me is, is totally gone? I don't think you ever will. I don't think you can. I think part of it is the, is the journey to continue the process. Um, so I started with Duder just doing the daily walk. We just would go for a walk every day, right? And that's how it triggered. And, and we just walk every day, walk every day. And after about a, maybe a year and a half of just walking every day and really getting inside my head, having my self conversations and, and becoming aware of a lot of different things, um, I started running one day. And I remember 
being out hiking on the trails one day and thinking, well, maybe I should just start running. And this was mm. after I had actually lost a lot of the weight already. I've lost about 70 pounds. And I ran for about 100 yards, 200 yards. And it was hard. But I remember thinking, maybe I could do this. And so my daily walk started to turn into a daily run. And then my daily run started to get longer and longer. And I started running half marathons, started running marathons. I've run two ultras and I have a 50 miler on the calendar in two months. And hmm. Duder and I went for a run this morning and we got five and a half miles in. So, you know, I run every day. So my daily walk just turned into a daily run. And so that daily run is probably a good answer to the old Jeff would never be doing that. Dude is the guy that gets up at 5 a.m. and goes for a run every day. So, and that That's becomes not... this one thing that is just not negotiable. I live in 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 up in Idaho, and I used to live in in Utah. And the winter times, running in the snow and the cold is hard, but I still did it every day. I even have some running shoes with some spikes, so I can run on the ice. I love the um, uh, well that that's dedication. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> What are some of the, I, I love this idea of you're checking yourself out in the mirror. You're trying to determine who you are. There's a certain level of self-awareness in that. What are some of the other things and behaviors that you learned uh, from watching Duder? Okay. Well, let, let's go back to when I just first brought Duder in and we would just start going for the walks. And, and these weren't long walks. I'm not talking about going out for a four hour walk. We're talking sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes, right? Just to go outside. The dog needed to go out. I needed to go out. And so I would leave the phone home and just have these conversations with myself and conversations with Duder. Dogs are great mm. therapists, right? I talked to him and man, he would listen and everything. What I looking back on this, Jay, three main things happened during this about a year's period of time, right? One is just awareness. Mm. And like you said, self-awareness, just awareness that something's not right when i look in the mirror i'm cringing when i just look up at the sky i'm like you know whatever everything was i was became aware that i physically was not healthy mentally was not healthy uh, just my view of the world was just not healthy you know so that self awareness is a key part if you're not aware that something's wrong you're never going to do anything the second thing was choice at some point along this time i said I've got to do something about this. I didn't know what. I didn't make a choice to do something. I just made a choice to do something, but not a clue what to do yet. But I said, I'm going to do something. I make a choice. And then the third thing was to explore my why. Why do I want to do this? And this is where fatherhood comes in, is mm. you know the natural thing. Well, my why? Oh, I want to do it for my wife. I want to do it for my kids. I want to do it for my grandkids. But then you also really have to dive a little deeper. And my so that was my initial why. And then I start adding things. My my why, why I do things has evolved and it actually continues to evolve to this day. Hmm. Because as, as more ideas come into your head, well, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to do this? But it still always comes back down to my wife, my kids and my grandkids. And then hmm. you have to add yourself. But, and, you know, in the theme of fatherhood. Why? Why are my kids my why? What's important to me to to do something for them? What's important for me to be a good father? What? Why is that important to me? I had to really explore that and spend a lot of time doing that. And I'm not sure that you can actually fully come to a complete realization of what that is. Because a lot of it just resides in your emotions. It resides in your gut, resides in your emotions. Because it's just one of those instinctual things as a father. I have three daughters, and it's just instinctual that you want to be a good dad. So, I think that that, that transformation, especially when it comes to feel-good fatherhood and new fathers, is something that we do a very poor job of onboarding new dads into, in, into this new relationship. Um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, you know, one of our feel good father ideas is this idea of the ritual or the, this, uh, this idea of the new identity of the fatherhood. And, um, in societies and tribes past, there's usually something for the father to do. 
something for the father to prepare. I think of, you know, if we go even back into the American history, into the Puritan days, it might be, he might build the crib. And so that's kind of like his, his material contribution to kind of what's going on. And there are some other separate societies that each have their own ritual, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that the father had some sort of role where he was telling society, telling folks, Hey, I'm adopting this new role. Old life is leaving, is being left behind. New life is being adopted. Here's the signifier of that. Uh, and so I think that that is something that from the feel good father perspective, uh, definitely requires, uh, some new, um, adoption, I think by society, that's something that I would love to see that us as feel good fathers extend to other new fathers as we onboard them into this new identity. I'm really curious about some of the whys, like what was this exploration? And let me cue this up just a little bit more. I found with my dog, Luna, that it unlocked things and emotions and care for me in having this dog that um, were parallel and distinct from my role as a father to, to my two daughters. And so um, I'm kind of curious to, and we can kind of talk about that later on, like how you actually feel about Deuter and what has that unlocked for you and how do you apply it? But what kind of like next layers down, like what was your specific why? Like as an example for other feel good fathers, what can they expect to see? Like what kind of exploration would be healthy for them? As I was going through this one, and I'm spending this year exploring my state of my life. A big thing that came up was regrets. Mm. And a lot of those regrets have to do with your kids as a father, right? So I'm 50 years old, turning 51. I'm 55 right now, just so you know. So I'm 50 years old and, and well, okay, Jay, I'm going to back up just a little bit to a little bit more of, of how this all started. So go back to when I'm in high school and mm. my girlfriend, her name's Holly. I refer to her in the book as the blonde. She gets pregnant in high school. We were married with a kid on the way at 18 years old. So I was thrown into fatherhood very early. <laughs> you know, parents throw you out of the nest, and Holly and I, my wife and I, are on our own with a kid on the way and not having a clue how to survive in the world. Yeah. And, you know, that's where you figure out where we're going to live, what we're going to eat, and how we're going to survive financially. So um, that all started back then. So we got started very early. So by the come back here now to 50 years old, all three of my kids are out of the house. They're they're gone. We've, we've booted them out. They're out finding their own way in the world. And so I'm still going through this struggle. And that's where the regrets come into, because I look back on my life as a father with my kids and just full of regrets. I'm like, holy mm. crap. Why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? Why, 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 why? So the regrets, regrets aspect was very powerful for me powerful for me. So driving my why is I didn't want to have any more regrets. I was it a big part kinda, of it. It makes sense now why the dude yeah. was the no regrets guy, that, that connection that really makes sense. Yeah. Please keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I kind of refer this as, as fear of regrets. I don't want to have any more regrets from this going on. And that fear is a very driving motivator. I don't want my kids to grow up and have memories of dad as just the guy sitting on the couch eating a frozen burrito watching a basketball game because that's what their memories were. Mm. And part of this is I think back on the memories I have of my own dad, right? What are, what what do I remember about my dad? I have some some negative memories of things that he said to me and those stick with you, don't they? They're hard to, to get out. But most of my memories of my dad are for, of a positive nature, and they're all around what he did. Just simply, he was a very active guy. It was very obvious that he loved his kids and, and all this. And so those are the positive memories. And so I, I try to relate to well, what memories do I want my kids to have of me? You know, Powerful and motivator. so 
yeah, that fear of additional regrets drove me. Okay, I got to do something different. I got to be somebody different. So I lost the weight, started thinking, viewing life differently, started being much more active, um, uh, developed different types of relationships with each kid. Because as you know, every kid's got their own personalities and mm -hmm. every relationship with all three of mine are very different and distinct. They also saw me working on my side of the relationship with my wife, with the blonde. I can't change her. She can't change me. Well, come on. We, we all know that. You can't change somebody. So I had to work on my side. And so they've now seen a better relationship that I have with my wife. And so I hope that's a memory that inspires them as well. So that's, um, <clears throat> I'm kind of curious, like that's, that's really awesome. And I'm kind of curious on, um, have you received, you know, uh, reinforcement from your fam on this transformation and what, what have they told you that they appreciate that you're willing to share? Well, they've seen me do things like lose weight. They've seen me go out running marathons and being physically active. They've seen me change what I eat. They've seen me change how I feel about the world. They've seen more positiveness from me rather than negativeness from me. They've seen me publish a book. I mean, that was a big deal for me, publishing mm -hmm. a book, right? Logging and documenting all of this, publish the book. So I've gotten, you know, just the standard, Dad, I am very proud of you moments. Those are awesome, right? And, you know, even if it is, you know, a, just a text. I get texts from my, my kids all the time and little Snapchats, you know, saying, Dad, we're proud of you. Good job on running the marathon. What's um, really powerful for me is things like uh, when my kids, I see them do things that I'm doing, like running mm -hmm. marathons. Two of my kids have run marathons. One of my kids just a few days ago, last weekend, finished a triathlon, a sprint triathlon. So mm. she's seen me do this and she's getting involved with it. So those are powerful moments. And she even told me the story of she went into a, a running store to buy some running shoes. And, and the guy was asking her why she runs. And she says, oh, I just run because my, my dad's inspired me. And mm. she loves to show. I run a lot, right? I run six, seven days a week. And she she loves to show my uh, she used to show my Strava the number of miles I ran for a year to all her running friends saying, look, look what my dad's doing, who's 54 years old. We Look what we can do, right? Yeah. So just watching them do some things that I'm doing is, is – um, and, oh, Jay, I got to tell you one more moment I, I had the other day that was really cool. So I published my book, and I, I have four grandkids as well. And I, I, you know, I told you we got married young. I have a 16-year-old granddaughter. I have a 13-year-old granddaughter, and then I have so I have three daughters, three granddaughters, and one grandson who's who's two. My 13-year-old granddaughter. So I gave a copy of my book to all my kids and all my grandkids, saying, "Hey, I wrote this book for you," and I really did. My 13-year-old granddaughter sent me a text, and she just said, "Grandpa, I loved your book. I read it in one night." It was awesome, you know. What I mean, you can't get any better than that when when you have that kind of influence over. So I hope that she walks away. That becomes a memory for her that she will keep with her for the rest of her life. Reading Grandpa's book. So that was a huge moment for me. Keeps me going. Just oh man, excites me. So you got your 50, your 50 mile, I was going to say 50 K, but it's 50 mile or 50 K. It's a 50 miler. Yeah. 50 miler. Okay. So a significantly different number. Um, then, okay. Uh, <laughs> coming up, what, um, what do you like, what do you think you're going to keep doing to grow and learn from, from Deuter even more? Like, do you think that there's another set of opportunities? You have some other things with, with these dog relationships in the future, you know, what, what are we looking at here? Well, a couple things. So the whole idea of me running a 50 miler is I, I got into this state where I had to keep challenging myself. 
if you don't challenge yourself, you'll never change. And I needed change, significant change. So the running became symbolic of all these other challenges I had to do. Mm. I had to find some humility to help my relationship with my wife. That was as challenging as running a marathon. I had to change my diet and my lifestyle. I canceled my TV subscription because I had to change my inputs because watching TV every night, just there's just no value to it. I mean, it yeah, every once in a while, I sit down and watch a movie, but crime and he's doing it every night. There's just nothing there. So those are challenges. It takes challenge to change what you eat. It takes challenge to change your inputs. So the running and the all this, the endurance marathon running is just symbolic of all these other challenges. It was a challenge to write a book. So I'm in a mode here, Jay, where I think that I am in a very good spot to help that person I used to be. Mm. There are so many people out there. Go to the grocery store. Go to the movie theater. Go to the airport and just look at everybody. Look at physically. Are they healthy? Are they healthy mentally? And if you're not mentally health healthy, if you're not physically healthy, it impacts your ability to be a good father. Let's tie that into fatherhood. It really does, right? So how can I – so those are my next challenges is to build uh, maybe a coaching program. I'm building an online course for these people that were that 50-year-old that I was that just were in a bad place in life. Maybe they need to lose some weight. Maybe they need to change some of their mindset. How can I help that person? So those are some of my next challenges. I'm mm -hmm. um, also became dude or taught me the power of dogs in our world, in our society. So the idea of of highlighting that. So there are some documentaries out there, but I want to start my own podcast called The Power of Dogs. Mm -hmm. And I've explored things like uh, there's organizations that position shelter dogs with veterans that are suffering from PTSD. Mm -hmm. These are great organizations because it helps the dogs, it helps the veterans, and that impact and that bond between th that veteran and that dog is powerful, and it gives them such comfort and helps them. Emotional support dogs. I have a history, you know, a little sh share a little bit more about myself, Jay. I have a history of uh, epilepsy and seizures in my life mm. when I was when I was young. And man, I can talk diet and how my diet helped. Diet helps with that. But seizure dogs. These dogs can be trained to uh, be positioned with someone with epilepsy and sense when a seizure is coming on and physically get under that owner so that when that owner starts to have a seizure and maybe falls to the ground, they will land on the dog. So these dogs can be trained to do this kind of stuff. And so these mm. are just fantastic stories. There's so many stories of dogs and the impact they have on people and our society. So that's one thing I want to do is start this podcast of, of that. I think I have two core, two core ideas and two core, I think, uh, question, lines of questions I'd like to really go down. The first would be for the feel good father listening that is a younger father, mm -hmm. right? The average age of fatherhood is going to be today. It's going to be in the mid thirties to probably early forties. Uh, cause that's really, it's kind of following the average age of marriage, which is uh, a lot older, uh, for men. And so I'm curious for our young feel good fathers. We know that there was a sense of regret. Um, what were sort of the big pitfalls or, or, or things that you would impart to a, a new feel good father that, that happens to be young? Like what, what are some pieces of wisdom or, 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 or things that happen to you that, um, that would be worthwhile sharing? I would say that I, when I was thrown into my fatherhood at a very young age, I really didn't know what I was supposed to do as a father. I didn't know what, I didn't have a clear feeling of what my role is as a father. What am I, what am I supposed to do here? Right. And, and it took a lot of time to do that. So for mm. the young fathers, I would say, explore that a little bit. What, what do you think your role is? What do you want your outcome to be as a father? Do you want to 
uh, you know, put the chains on that kid and have them do exactly what you tell them to do so that they're going to live the life exactly how you want it? Probably not. Mm. Do you want to, is your role to provide them with some tools and some knowledge so that when they're ready to get out of the nest, they're ready to find their own way in the world as best that they can? That's kind of what I evolved to. Was I there at the beginning? Absolutely not. I have a clue. So I guess, and so how does a, a young father get to that is really explore that. What is my role? What do I want my legacy to be? Right? On one way to do that is one thing I've actually been exploring in the last uh, four or five months in my, my journey is I keep learning all new kinds of things is this idea of of looking at the world in from my future self side. Mm. So if I'm a young dad, write yourself a letter when you're 30, when you're 35, when you're 40. Write yourself a letter so when you're writing your letter as your 40-year-old future self. And what has been your impact on your kids? Write a letter to yourself as your 35-year-old future self. What has been your impact on your kids? So that you have kind of a clear understanding of what you want your legacy to be when you're that age. When you're my age and your kids are finally moving out of the house, what do you want your legacy to be? So start thinking about that future self idea. And I've tried to incorporate this in just about everything I've done. I actually, I've got a 50 miler, as you mentioned, Jay, coming up. How do you prepare for that, right? This is a brutal race. It's 11,000 feet of vertical climb. It's not just 50 miles flat running. It's crazy stuff. Okay. Physically, you have to train and all this, but the biggest part of a race like this is all in your head. And so I've actually wrote a letter to myself as that guy standing at the finish line. What does it feel like? What am I going to feel like when I cross that finish line? Am I going to be excited? Am I proud of myself? You know, all of this. I wrote a letter to myself. So I guess that's one idea that the, the young dads today can can really explore a little bit. What do you want your legacy to be? I love this idea of being accountable to your future self. This idea of uh, projecting into it and then growing into that person that you want to be. And I think as an overall theme, it, it seems really to encapsulate uh, what sort of deuter has taught you, at least from the lessons that like in your life, that this, this core, core idea of self-examination uh, probably follows like, what is the intention? What's the, what's on the horizon? What's the mountain that you want to reach? And then how will you feel when you get there? I, I think that's really, that's really powerful. That's a really great lesson. I think for feel good fathers, how about when it comes to uh, dogs? And so there's the, the classic dog versus cat thing. So, so let's talk a little bit about dogs in the family. Like what have you perceived as far as bringing an animal into your house? <laughs> I have a chapter in my book called are dogs better than kids. <laughs> Explain this a little bit. In some ways, dogs are better than kids because they're, you know, in some ways they're not. But, um, yeah, so my wife and I, our kids are out of the house. We bring Duder in. We actually have brought a couple other dogs in since then as well. So they're, they've are they become our new kids, is these dogs, because the kids are gone, and they're they just part of our daily life. Um, yeah, I don't know how much stuff we want to share here, Jay, but my wife Thanks. and I have been married 37 years. Congratulations. And I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story here and I do not recommend this for everyone and I do not recommend this for anyone who has been married for less than 35 years. My wife and I do not sleep in the same room. I sleep in the basement in my own room. She sleeps upstairs in her own room. We found that that works well cuz I wake up early and I go running every day. She has a different pattern, but we both find that we've been married long enough that we can pull that off. But Duder sleeps in the bed with me. So he's a core part of my life. I mean, he's with me all the time. I work from home. 
he's he's in the other room right now waiting for me. We went on a run this morning. We're going to go on another run tomorrow morning. He's just a poor card of our life. We have another dog named Roxy right now, and um, and she's kind of like my wife's dog. And my wife has an Instagram page for the dogs, Duder and Roxy. You want to follow them? She's got some great pictures of our, our dogs up there. But one story here is we had Duder, and then we got another dog named Daisy. And she got hit by a car. Mm. And we went through a period of time where she had, one of her legs was amputated, and she just got worse. And we ended up putting her down. But the the effect that we felt, my wife and I, of going through this and losing a dog was a lot more than what we expected. I didn't think that we would have this many emotions and it became evident of just how much those dogs became part of our lives. I mean, they are part of our kids. They're as much our kids as are. And my, all of my kids, well, two of my kids have dogs themselves. And so they feel the same thing. So it, it's, it's pretty interesting. I'm, I want to, call back to sleeping in separate rooms because that's not uh that concept is is not unheard of in our history as married peoples that's true and so um you know when i when i think back to nobility in europe to all that time period it was very common for this the spouses to sleep in their own separate spaces is this something that uh, you engage with or dialogue with with your friends, or is it is it common information? Uh, what what are their reactions? How do you respond to it? Oh, I write about it in my book, so anyone that's read my book knows knows about this, right? Um, I I just I don't <laughs> frankly it doesn't matter if anyone else approves or not. It works well for me. It works well for the blonde. So we're both okay with it. It's not like Dear, I'm sleeping in another room because I can't stand sleeping with you anymore. No, it was a mutual thing. You know, she sleeps better when I'm gone because I don't, I don't snore and I don't stink up her room and she has it all to herself and she likes that. And I'm down in the basement where it's a little cooler, not as hot, so it all works good. It, it actually works really well. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> I love that. I love that. So um, you can find the. Uh, you can find the. A link to Dude and Duder, the book, down in the description. Uh, Jeff, if folks also want to get a hold of you or get to know more more about you, learn more about your journey, learn more about this future coaching program, where can they go? Probably the best place is our, our website. And our website is dudeanddeuter.com. And you can follow me on some of the social media platforms. There's links out there. And if you like dogs, go to Duder and Roxy at Instagram. You can follow my wife and, and her Instagram page for our dogs over there. Uh, my book is a transformation, short little lessons, full of lessons that I've learned from my dog. And, you know, if there's someone in your life that maybe in their midlife that you think might need some inspiration, buy them a copy of the book. And mm. it's, a, it's a simple, easy read. And, you know, hopefully I'm, tr it's what I'm trying to do is, is inspire the same thing. Cause I am not the same person I used to be five years ago. And I feel like I am just getting started. I'm 55 and I'm just getting started and it feels fantastic. So anyone who thinks that they're in their fifties and they've got too many regrets and oh, I wasted my life with my kids as a father, that's bull. You can change. You can mm. improve your relationship with your kids. You can be a good grandpa. You can still have a strong legacy out there. So that's my final message right there. Awesome. Uh, Jeff Goodridge, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Hello, everyone. I transformed my life in midlife with the help from my dog. One of the things that I did to transform was really develop the better relationship as a father to my kids. If you want to improve your relationship with your kids and be a better father, listen to the Feel Good Fatherhood show. I know that's right, because uh, Google and YouTube, in their wisdom, have put this video right here for you. It's going to be one of mine. It's going to be another conversation just like this, getting better at fatherhood, listening to other fathers talk about it right here. This is the one. Click the video. Click the video.